who was briefed for two weeks in an underground facility shortly after he took office. Um, I don't know exactly what he was told, but it was two weeks, and it was briefed about, he was briefed about the extraterrestrial presence here on planet Earth. Um, so as far as what the secret space program would entail, look, I'm sure they're briefed on some very advanced things, and um, specifically, I don't know. I, d I don't want to speculate because I, I don't know for sure. But I'm sure that there's such a program that exists, and uh, it is knowledge. There is knowledge that there is an extraterrestrial presence that is here. It's, they're not out there. They're down here in the atmosphere and on the ground. All right. Thank you so much, Richard. There was a, there was a timing issue asked. Could I follow up on that? Uh, yes. Historically speaking. Um, I've considered this a lot because I had two different periods of service in the secret space program, you know, time traveling as a child in the late 60s and early 70s, and then going to Mars as a college student in the um, first half of the 1980s. I think it's clear that we, we entered the era of space travel around 1960. Of course, there was the Shepard flight and Glenn's flight and in 61, 62, into space and then around the Earth. And then from my knowledge, I can state that we had landed American astronauts on Mars in 1964. The documentary source that I can cite, I can't proffer it, but hopefully someday it'll be found through the work of, let's say, Michael Saller or another leading researcher, was a French external intelligence organization dossier that I was asked to read uh, in the summer of 1980 that was also read by a future president, Barack Obama, and the first woman to direct DARPA, Regina Dugan. So there, there was a reference, an anecdote, to a crash landing by an American team of astronauts on Mars where they perished as a result of not being rescued by the Martian uh, humanoids in 1964. Clearly, we then crossed the threshold of time travel in 1970 because that threshold, I can say that again, it's testimonial evidence, not documentary evidence, but it's my, uh, my, uh, my eyewitness testimony that we began time traveling by being set back in time upon arrival while Tesla teleporting across the country between New Jersey and New Mexico, in my case, in 1970. That's not just a benchmark or a goalpost. It was the year 1970. So we crossed the threshold of time travel in 70, and we know from the testimony of individuals like Michael Relf as to when the jumping to Mars began that it occurs around 1975-76, and we have the faking of Hughes' death in 74. Um, and so I would put the crossing of the advanced time travel slash space threshold at around 1975 to 80. Those would be All my right, very good, thank you. Next question. If I could go to New Jersey or New Mexico, I'd choose New Mexico. <laughs> my question, I, for anyone who wants to respond, I first I've got a question for Corey and then a question about alien, ancient space travel. Corey, you mentioned that your experiences started when you were very, very young and that you were actually taken to a facility for some of your education. It's a simple, how was this presented to your parents and to the school and to the whole world that you lived in? My parents just believed it was a different curriculum I was being, being brought into that included trips off campus fairly often. So there was nothing sinister for them to consider. Okay. It was not something that was on their mind. So it didn't seem controversial or no. weird. The other thing, several of you have military experience. Are we still requiring inside people to sign their lives away? Or be, are people put in jail for coming forward? I think we were actually uh, had a quasi-military status. I've been told over the years that I'm a Navy officer. The closest I've gotten to proving that is that I had a a picture taken of myself several months after I first jumped to Mars in October of 1981. I was attending UCLA and I was sent down to the quartermaster's office at the Long Beach, California Naval Station and a photograph was taken of me in a naval uniform. I've also received bulletins from different veterans organizations even though I never conventionally served. 
So I think fr from my point of view, what's relevant about the military angle is we were in a quasi-military status so that the intelligence community, particularly naval intelligence, could govern our activities and they could keep a personnel file on us as Navy officers. But I think it's important to say that even those of us, I think, for example, I think Corey might agree with this, even those of us who were receiving forms of military training and interacting, for example, with Army guards or Naval Intelligence officers fairly frequently, were never mainstream military mm -hmm. um, officials. Which or, gives uh, some deniability. Well, that's what they were doing. Right. I mean, they were, they were tracking us through the Office of Naval Intelligence and uh, I, I was even told that I was promoted to lieutenant commander when I earned my Juris Doctor <laughs> degree, but I have no way of proving that. We were told that we had earned the Space Medal of Honor after we finished our activities jumping to Mars. I don't have a certificate, a medal, a letter from the Navy Secretary. So it really was sort of a no man's land of plausible deniability that they okay. had architected. For. And my question related to ancient civilizations, we're here at a conference about the sort of relatively recent UFO phenomena. Do any of you believe that it does go back to ancient times like the pyramids? Absolutely, okay. and I, I think we would all agree that we've been visited by extraterrestrials for eons. One or more may have even been directly involved in our evolution or even our existence as a species. Certainly uh, on Pegasus I was educated in the fact that the that after the solar system catastrophe around 9500 BC, the small grays, at least one of the small gray species, was critically involved in kickstarting our civilization in ancient Sumer around 5,000 years ago. So I think there's more than you describe. I think there's a, a direct causal link between ET visitation and involvement in our, our history, our, our biological evolution, our planetary evolution. All right, thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. Yeah, this is uh, mostly directed um, at Corey. Um, I'd like to just, I have a, there's kind of a couple of parts to it and I'll get through it real quick. Um, some of it is my own personal experience that for me were like gigantic aha things watching Cosmic Disclosure and saying that's what that was. So one of the things was that I have all these fragmented memories as a kid of, and I don't want to go into the details because I don't want to take the time, but basically it was, a, it was the MeLab program. Um, I was probably washed out. I only maybe remember going out on the bus maybe two or three times. Um, I do remember being, feeling like what was going on was like really inappropriate. Um, I also have a memory of, uh, you know, being like in a chair and getting injections and stuff, so I think that was probably blank slated at that time. So. Uh, that was one thing. Now, I had another um, experience in my 20s, and I, um, using a combination of the stuff from Robert Monroe, and I was also a member of AMORC, um, anybody that might know who th what that is, but you get to the seventh degree and they teach astral projection. So um, I developed this ability, and uh, at one point, um, I had an experience where I, my, my psychic body was basically abducted. And there was a complete, complete loss of proprioception. So there was an experience of being a consciousness, but it was like a 360 spherical kind of consciousness instead of, you know, normally we have our consciousness coming out of our face. Do you have a thing. real quick question? We are really the question is, out of here. <laughs> the question yeah. is, is, have you ever heard of this kind of technology, and I, uh, um, I also have a colleague that told me that there's, he was, uh, um, came across this information about like soul shredding technology where they can abduct your soul and shred it and use it as a commodity. So have you ever heard of anything like this? I mean, there, there's, there has, has definitely been a lot of research in these programs into the soul and transferring the soul, um, it, verifying the existence of a soul. So what the interesting part is that the Nazis, they originally began to, I guess, marry some of these uh, esoteric kind of principles, I guess we would call, with science. And they started developing what were, were some very interesting scientific theories and, and, and uh, ideas about how to create technology. So 
I, I don't know if that. Well, I mean, it, I mean, if you haven't heard specifically of it, that's, that's fine. Yeah. The other thing, the other experience that I did have is I, I put up a website um, with a lot of information that connects uh, the information of Itzek Bentoff with the, the, the law of one, and the, the correlations are amazing that come out of that, and you can develop a whole cosmology out of it. So I put up a website on this, and shortly thereafter, um, I started having like this heat kind of experience on the top of my head, and uh, there's no question here. I just want to say this to kind of validate some of Corey's stuff. The, the psychotronic stuff is real. The psychotronic right. stuff is yeah. real. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Gould, uh, Reno Skywatch on Facebook. Uh, in your opinion, this is for whoever wants to feel this question, is there an ET component to the ongoing terraforming of our planet's atmosphere by geoengineering, that is uh, chemtrails, and uh, the activities that we see in our sky every day? Thank you. I don't believe so, and that, in fact, was the only component um, of Bill's presentation yesterday that I disagreed with. I think it's clear that if we go back to the 1997-98 fr time frame, we have the memorandum from that seminar at which Dr. Edward Teller suggested that we needed to, to start spraying oxides of aluminum and barium into the troposphere to stem global warming to prevent, ultimately, the, on the onset of a new ice age, as articulated by Art Bell and, Wet and Whitley Strieber in their, uh, in their very highly creative work, The Coming Global Superstorm, which presents Dr. Andrew Marshall's threat assessment for the Office of Net Assessment, which is basically catastrophic global warming followed by a very destructive new ice age. And that's my explanation for the chemtrail spraying program. Okay, thank you. Next question, please. Yeah, I'll be succinct. Um, I see here a spectrum of, uh, of knowledge <clears throat> from incredible direct experience through to practical research tempered with good spe skepticism. So MUFON's mission is the scientific study of UFOs. The question is, what responsibility, if any, do each of you personally feel to that mission and uh, to navigate a, a path of balance between the sensational and the credible? Specifically, what responsibility do you each have to provide actionable data for others to interrogate? If I could quickly interject, we're trying to keep the focus on our space pro on the secret space sure. program, and if you could uh, adjust your questions that way, we are so limited. If we go on to off the planet here, we are going to never. Uh, I'll, I can quickly jump in and answer. And I'll just Thanks. very make it very quick. So I feel a very strong obligation to present my evidence in as scientific and historically defensible way as I possibly can. That includes evidence for a secret space program, um, recognizing that this is a difficult subject to um, to delve into. Uh, so it's using a combination of caution and courage. So you have to do both. You have to be, uh, you have to be careful with the facts, but you have to be brave with the facts. And if, if the evidence leads you into a certain direction that uh, puts you at odds with society, you still are obligated to go there. Uh, but you have to adhere to what the data tells you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I was question. actually going to add, uh, one, one of the reasons why I never really embraced the UFO um, movement was because from the beginning, I never saw this as a scientific problem. For me, it was always a national security issue. It was always the deeply political, and so that's why I was one of the people that actually pioneered uh, the term exopolitics and have continued to work with the exopolitics movement because fundamentally, I believe the UFO phenomenon is not a scientific issue involving the acquisition of evidence and quantitative analysis of that evidence, but is actually a deeply political phenomenon requiring us to really investigate the underlying political processes that uh, it basically contextualizes this whole UFO phenomenon. Well, it's really and those two and, and much more. But yes, I agree yeah. with you. It's political, it's scientific, and it is much more. And as an historian, and of course Richard has written a book on the national security, so uh, we have some very distinguished and, and very well-researched uh, panelists here. Next question, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I am an experiencer and a contactee, and I also come from a military family. Um, because I have a very highly developed right brain, I've been on many journeys. I understand the space program. <clears throat> and my question to you, which I feel I do understand, is it's been mentioned that there are slave races. And they take humans and children. I would like to know your opinion and where you get the information on where they get these humans and children from. 
Okay, let me quickly uh, advise advise everyone of time. We're down to about uh, at, at most 15 minutes, including question, answers, and to the end of the line. So if you could help us out. Well, I would, I would cite the fact that Robert David Steele, formerly of CIA, recently reported on the Alex Jones Show that there may be a, a situation involving abduction of human children on Earth with subsequent enslavement on Mars. I certainly never saw anything like that on Mars the 40 or so times that I went 30 years ago, 35 years ago, but I did write an email to Bob Steele informing him of the fact that in my paper, The Discovery of Life on Mars, which was published almost 10 years ago, 2008, I showed that in a ravine west of the home plate plateau in the Gusev crater of Mars, there was a, there was a, a, a morass of a, several hundred humanoid bodies, both male and female, clothed in, in uniformly blue clothing, suggestive of regimentation. So again, that's why I would urge objectified open-mindedness. I mean, it's a crazy concept to believe that there's not just earthlings who have been kidnapped here, abducted here on Mars, but that they might be children who have been enslaved there. But I did alert Robert Steele of the fact that this was reported, this, this, this ravine full of bodies that could have been an open-air cemetery, a place of ritual human sacrifice, or some genocidal killing field has been in the public domain now for 10 years and has been largely ignored, I think because we are too, we, we are too easy to indulge the giggle factor when those types of facts surface. Well, and cer certainly uh, some claims, uh, some people would probably have to be psychologically prepared to seriously consider because uh, not everyone is equipped to just even consider some of the things. Uh, can we just quickly move on because we will not get our questions if we don't. Yeah, I was wondering if the panel could comment on President Trump's appointment of a new space department uh, just within the last few weeks and I think under the auspices of the Air Force and a related question is is the competition between the Air Force and the Navy in space healthy, or what's going on with that? Okay, let's start down at the end and just come down very quickly with Richard and... Uh, um, a lot of assumptions in these questions. So, um, uh, relating to Trump's appointment, other people may say that they know. I don't really know if anyone knows uh, the details because we're not in the administration. Uh, it does seem to me reasonable to assume that uh, you know, there's, there's going to be an attempt to bring out in the open, uh, or there could be an attempt to bring out in the open some of the clandestine breakthrough, breakthroughs that have been made over the last number of years or decades, uh, and through the auspices of a new program. I'm only speculating. I really don't know for sure. Um, I would also uh, just say it's logical to do it because um, we're moving into, er into an era where uh, the rest of the world is moving into space. It's not simply a domain of national uh, nations, but private enterprises increasingly are going to go out there. And I think the U.S. government realizes, just as they broke the Air Force off from the Army back in 1947, um, that space has, has warranted the same sort of you know, focus. Um, Navy and Air Force have always had competition. Uh, heck, back in the 1940s, the U.S. Navy had this so-called revolt of the admirals. Uh, uh, it's a part of history, you can look it up. It was a big part of uh, the rivalry back then that the Navy had with the Air Force. I don't think it's ever gone away. If they do have competing space programs uh, today, well, I don't know that they have competing space programs, but if they do, then um, they each probably think that theirs is the best. I don't uh, know. All right. But uh, I, I suspect that there's not competing space programs. I suspect that it is, if there is a, a space, a secret space program, Army, uh, excuse me, Air Force and Navy, I would think that they are not separate and competing. That would be my uh, position. Other people may have their own. Okay, very quickly, 30 seconds or less. Uh, I think that there is a competing program. I, I think that the Navy has uh, s space battle groups, uh, these kind of aircraft carrier type battle groups, but deployed in deep space. And some good evidence for that is uh, what uh, Gary McKinnon says he hacked into uh, in, in, in uh, the NASA and the, the Pentagon uh, computer system where he describes uh, fleet to fleet transfers and lists of non-terrestrial officers. I think that better describes how you have uh, you know, up to eight s Navy space battle groups, how they're transferring personnel between these different fleets as opposed to what the Air Force has in terms of uh, space surveillance systems comprising uh, two or more space stations. Well, okay. they may be com complementary rather than competing for all we know. Okay. I don't, I don't quickly, know of any departmental rivalry, 
but I would just like to emphasize, just for the good of the record, that NASA is not our only space agency, so I would kind of displace that question into the, into the domain of government agencies rather than military departments. The, the, I think a major import of my testimony is that indeed the CIA is one of our space agencies. Uh, very quickly, do uh, Bill or Corey, are your pass? Okay, very good, thank you. Next question. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having the courage to do this. It's fantastic. It's awesome. Courage, I, I, yes. <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> it takes a lot of courage to step out of the box. It does. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to rent a billboard in downtown Chicago that says there's anti-gravity, there's zero point, they're hiding it from you. That's how frustrated I am with this. But, but my question is, um, regarding, regarding evidence for a secret space program, right out in the lobby we have somebody who gives tours with the night vision goggles and claims to be successful almost every single night. I'd like to know what you guys think about that because I've seen some of the videos on YouTube and to me, that's a real eye opener. I mean, it's fantastic. Totally agree. I think uh, a lot of it's very compelling. Um, absolutely. I've d had uh, several nights with night vision and uh, looked at lots of video and uh, anyone who, who gets access to it, you look up above you. Uh, it can sometimes look like Grand Central Station above your head. And uh, the question is, what are those things? And some are maybe um, a little more ordinary than others, but there's a lot that goes on up, up above our heads when we um, have the technology to see it. And I do think that there, that is some evidence for clandestine activities. All up, right. up there, for sure. Thank you so much. Excellent. This is for Bill, Bill Tompkins, your secretary. I have a question. Did you and your secretary ever touch each other? <laughs> <laughs> now, what does that, what, what does that have to do with the secret space program? No, yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, I want right. to know if, I mean, she was an alien, I, right? I, an ET. I, I have so to did say, you ever, like, shake hands? On I, the, I have shake to hands? <laughs> I have to say, I believe my wife is right over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not going to put anybody on the spot. No, but I mean, <laughs> it, the but skin, actually, did you ever touch her? Actually, no, we never had sex, okay? No, no I'm serious. Did you shake hands or anything like that? Did you ever shake hands with her? I believe she's talking about a different sort of communication with the touch yes, of the hand. Yes, get your minds out of the gutter. Just, right. you uh, know. No, sometimes Was the skin truth, different? Wait, wait a minute. Sometimes, truthfully, in a meeting, okay, where everybody is upset, we can't come to a conclusion, she would put her, if she was in the meeting there too, she would put her arm on the mind of my back and whisper to me, tell him about so-and-so. Okay. Truthfully, I mean, th she was a beautiful person, but tremendously brilliant. Okay, thank you. And Corey Good, could you talk about the 20 years a little bit more? Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we just have a minute to talk about 20 years. Well, okay. I mean, that's, that's just mind-boggling. Could you say a little bit more? Yes, it is mind-boggling. Out of all of my testimony, probably the... 20 and back part, not, I guess, not mentioning the eight foot tall blue bird alien are the places where you usually lose people. So <coughs> the information that Dr. Sala has located about the different technologies that we're developing for reversing aging through uh, pharmaceutical means, I think, um, goes to show that these things are slowly going to be let out to the public. And hopefully at some point we'll get some sort of gene therapy, telomere therapy that's going to um, help us have a, a, a better quality of life and an extended life as well. Excellent. First, I tip my hat to everyone wearing a jacket in Florida. So, um, First question. Every, several of you had in your presentations the octagon-shaped uh, Hubble whatever made up of the remnants of spacecraft. First of all, what color are those, and are they still in active use? Real yes. brief, please. <clears throat> yes, they are. The outside are is a reflective white. Okay, thank you. It, it's, it's used from uh, expelled pieces of uh, rocketry that was used to okay. launch satellites. My second question is, we can see the space station from the ground. Why can't we see these craft if they're in such large population? You're going to be able to see, I guess, a little bit of a reflection from here and there, here and there from this space station, the, the one that I'm talking about that's 500 miles out. I can't remember how far the 
um, ISS says is, is like 300 miles around 250. <coughs> so you are going to see, I mean, even the ISS, they see these things all the time. And if it's a craft, they're, they're told it's a concept craft, you didn't see it, and they go along with it. Okay, thank you. Next. Hi, uh, three questions, two are related. Um, one is, um, why, would, um, why would Trump uh, g uh, push for releasing all of those uh, suppressed patents? Um, two, would anybody tell him anything that was top secret? Um, <laughs> And um, three. Let's try not to get political. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I'm curious. I mean, he can't keep a secret. So, wh so what does he know? I mean, why is he pushing for the suppressed patents? Would anybody tell him? And then my last question is, what does it mean to be a human? Uh, again, let's, let's, let's keep, keep answers. I, I, okay. I, I would point. aver that, uh, I haven't closely studied Trump's decision on that, but I would aver that it sounds to me, I suspect it's a, in the language of Watergate, it's a public limited hangout because it's not widely known by the American people that there are secret math patents, not just technical <laughs> patents, but literally mathematical formulae governing things like our communications infrastructure that certainly I don't think were subject to that or talked about in terms of that disclosure by Trump. Uh, I would just jump in and say, um, uh, in one, one very fascinating conversation I had with a, a former high-level uh, man with CIA I've talked about, um, who's very deeply interested in the UFO issue, uh, one time I asked him what everyone would love to ask, how much do presidents know? Uh, his answer to me was, some have known more than others. Um, he said, you know, you have to keep in mind, uh, presidents come and go, and uh, those of us uh, wear lifers. Uh, some presidents, he said, are reliable, others are not, and so on and so on. So this was a few years ago. Um, by the way, he said to me that um, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and George Bush Sr. all knew. Uh, Bill Clinton, and not as much, and George W. Bush, uh, to his knowledge, not as much, and that's when I was speaking with him. Um, relating to uh, Trump, it has to be said, you know, Trump, uh, there, are, it is, there are claims that Trump has been briefed on things. Um, I don't know how to confirm those. Uh, but the main thing to keep in mind, when you say he can't keep a secret, you have to keep in mind that there is a war going on right now, of course, between uh, the intelligence community and, and him. Uh, Chuck Schumer. Uh, said to Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! a number of uh, months ago, he said, look, when you're having it out with the CIA, they can take you down six ways till Sunday. He was talking about the CIA and Trump. Why she didn't follow up with an actual journalistic question is beyond me, um, but she didn't. Um, so the, the fact is that when you have leaks coming out from within the intelligence community, which is obviously happening, you can't blame it all on him. Um, but w a thing I've always wondered is if uh, we have the disclosure moment, if uh, President Trump were to do it, it, we're in an interesting position in our world. If Obama had made a disclosure a few years ago, people would have you know, accepted it, I think, maybe, some people. If Trump does it, you could see a 2 a.m. tweet saying, everyone knows this is real, and the question is, would he be believed? That's the real question, if <laughs> Trump were to do a disclosure. Maybe it's all by design. If, if, if we could move on, we are just down to minutes. Thank you so much. Hi, next question, Bill. Um, uh, I tend to believe you because you're backed up by a lot of evidence that comes out by Michael Salop. Um One thing is uh, Forrestal was uh, supposedly jumped out of the six-story building, which I think was untrue. But do you guys think that there is any relation between Forrestal and his um, protege, which was Kennedy, who went after World War II to check out all these installations that the Germans had? And do you think there's any correlation to the two of them actually end up ending in a short demise, like, like what happened. We have two minutes left, maybe three. Actually, uh, you're correct, really. Uh, that situation was uh, unbelievable. Uh, Forrestal was pushed out of that window. Uh, Forrestal uh, only a few months earlier structured this whole thing with Adam Riccobata to initiate uh, some two dozen Navy operatives to get in every place in Germany and all the occupied countries over there and find out what's going on. And I think the fact that they murdered him for, do for doing this is, uh, is, is it's tragic. All right, thank you so much. Really quick, gentlemen, thank you for your testimonies and coming forward. I'm the Arizona State Director for MUFON. I have an entire team of investigators behind me. These people are trained, they're objective in their thinking, they're open-minded. You guys come before us, 
no evidence, no artifacts to lay here on the table, no, rec no records, but yet I ask you, if you were in my shoes, how would you react if you were in my shoes? I would begin by studying the law of evidence in which uh, witnesses are free to testify as to what they did and saw and have such testimony regarded as direct evidence. So I challenge the epistemology of what you just presented. You made an assertion that we haven't offered evidence. I've been offering evidence now for 13 years. There are hundreds and hundreds of facts, and I really have to commend Michael Sallow for beginning the process of using FOIA, as he has in Bill Tompkins' case, to verify what I've said. So I think we have to be very cautious about how we define evidence in this realm. The with respect, I have to disagree with you, Andy. Um, evidence is, uh, t excuse me, testimony is not just testimony. Testimony is not equal to evidence. It is uh, evidence. No, it's it's no, it's direct well, evidence. It is, evidence is but not it is not, it's not acceptable. No, no, that's proof. That's another issue. You said evidence. Testimony Witnesses is simply because testify. it is. Richard, this is not true. You said it in your presentation yesterday. Witnesses are free. We, people go to jail for life every day in this country based on what others testified as to what they saw yes. and what they did. And some testimonies and are true. And as evidence. And some testimonies that are false. No, and that can't be confused wait, wait. with the issue of proof, that you then impose a certain standard of proof when you've decided which evidence of what people saw and did you're going to admit into the body of evidence that you consider. In them. all trials, testimony is accepted and rejected. And that's it is right. accepted that's because right. it is deemed truthful. Yeah. It is rejected yeah. because it is deemed false. And that's, so not all testimony is equal. Look, uh, Something that a witness s says they saw or did is no more or less probative than a document. If you hang your document on the written records of the deep state, we're going to be continue. We're going to be continue to be constrained within the limits that the deep state has imposed on us regarding what they've chosen to declassify. So clearly, eyewitness testimony is evidence, and it deserves the standing of evidence. And it's and as evidence, it needs to be okay. examined. <laughs> And either accepted or rejected yeah. based on how valid it appears. Okay, um, I, I do want to add that on Friday night I actually presented, did my presentation in terms of 12 key claims that uh, Bill Tompkins had made, e what I thought were very significant claims. And, and for each of those claims I did present qu quite a number of documents, uh, FOIA documents, the National Archives documents. So for the gentleman who was just standing here, I mean, that is evidence. I mean, that is documentary evidence. They, they come from the National Archives. I, I, we applied to the National Archives and I've got 1,500 pages of documents uh, on Admiral Boulder that actually substantiated uh, what Bill Tompkins was saying. And prior to getting those documents, we didn't even know who Admiral Boulder was because he had misspelled the name in the book. So we were trying to confirm <laughs> that the, this such an admiral existed and we found out that he did exist. You know, I showed a document actually comparing the National Archives signature of Admiral Boulder uh, with a document from, uh, the, from Bill Tompkins' uh, exit pass, which showed that he was taking packets out of Naval Air Station San Diego with the admiral's uh, signature on it, which substantiates a key part of his testimony. And so I think that's the way research works. First you have mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the eyewitness coming forward making their claims, and then researchers like us look at the documents, look at the National Archives, do the Freedom of Information Act, Let me uh, just say, and, say and compare with others. Excuse me, that uh, uh, Andrew Basaggio has to exit and uh, prepare for his next uh, setup. So. Uh, we're not kicking him out, by the way. <laughs> but he's the next one online to present down, down the hall. And so we'll let him get on his way. It'll take him a few minutes to set up for his presentation. And so we'll kind of wrap up uh, during that time frame. And this is uh, really terrific. Um, did you have something to say? Yeah. yeah. I, if you would just hold it for a minute. All right. Uh, uh, I, no. <laughs> I will. No, I, Th that's what we're trying I, to do. I, th I think this is important. Uh, I have a photograph, and let me explain how I got it. I'm in meetings with people on uh, highly technical aspects of this subject. A young lady, when I uh, started talking about different types of extraterrestrial vehicle, a young lady at the other end of the table, she says, I have one. So after the meeting was over, I contacted her, and she said, yes, I do have a photograph. 
So two weeks later at the next meeting, of course, I asked her to please bring this. Okay, this photograph was taken in Oceanside, California, uh, right off of a cul-de-sac on Lake Boulevard, okay, which overlooks Carlsbad. In this photograph are five separate UFOs at 300 feet. This photograph, when we were in uh, close-ups of this, um, I, I, I have to say, this vehicle came out of a massive vehicle that's parked out in the galaxy, okay? This vehicle comes down, five of them, and they, the shape of them has windows on top. We determined the windows were to get the difference between the ambient temperature out in space and temperature at 300 feet. So we have four windows. The sides are serrated on. It's not round, it's flat, okay? Now, these photographs then, friends of mine at, uh, when I worked at uh, Northrop, were in San Diego. So I take this photograph to them. They built a six foot wooden model of this, this photo uh, photograph. They take it up to the old wind tunnel in Hawthorne. They put it in there. This turns out to be the, the, the best, lo best method to disperse five, four gases uh, for any other shape of any extraterrestrial vehicle. This is a photograph of five reptilian vehicles. And, and uh, I've even got it in my second book. I'm just saying this is this this is not a made-up picture. This is real. These extraterrestrials are in our atmosphere as we're talking, whether it's day or night. Okay, they're really there. And really, I think we all can agree that uh, regardless of anyone's opinion, an opinion doesn't matter. What matters is what is really real. Yes. The the evidence and what is really real. And the real thing is that. There's so much more. I know we could talk to, to our, our panelists forever, but they will have DVDs of each presentation available so that a lot of the things that you weren't able to discuss today that you'll be able to, to get in a DVD. It's out at the, the MUFON desk or, and, or order later. So that's the good news. Richard, it appeared you had something to say. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I guess it wasn't that important. N n oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, we're. Uh, I think uh, the the key thing was to get Andrew out so that he could set up for his next presentation. That does take a few minutes, uh, technically. We might have time for one more quick question, maybe. <laughs> and this has to be quick. <laughs> I only met one of them uh, about 10 years later in another meeting, and that was it. They did not come back. All right. Thank you very much. Have you all really enjoyed this? Give it a good hand. Oh, one question. One question. Yes. Come to the microphone. This, by the way, is uh, Frank Jacob, the uh, director producer of Packing for Mars. Thanks. Um, my question is about the 20 and back program. Um, I guess to you, to you, Corey, because as far as I know, there are three people that have that have basically made this claim: yourself, uh, Randy Kramer, and uh, Michael Ralph. Do you guys uh, ever have you ever have you ever had contact, or have you ever considered comparing notes? Because it seems like that program can't be too diverse. It seems like it seems to be a standard being used. Or would you consider kind of getting together? in the spirit of let's get to the bottom of this and, and, and compare notes. Sure, I'd consider it, uh, but to this point, I have not compared notes or gotten together with any of those two individuals. And do you have any, do you want to, or does, do you feel yeah, like be, it, you I'm should? I'm happy to work with anyone to be able to try to 
get this information out to the wider public and um, you know in a, in a way that they can digest would be great and how can how could one contact you to to sort of start this dialogue perhaps sure uh, sphereBeingAlliance.com is my website okay. and uh, sphereBeingAlliance at gmail.com is a good okay. way to get hold of me okay awesome I want to make I want to make one last uh, comment if I may uh, I, I want to emphasize that um, I'm I, I've had some contrary things to say to some of the gentlemen on this panel here but I I don't necessarily disbelieve anything nor do I believe um, I, I think that um, beyond the little circumscribed fence that we're all placed within by our officially established truth that there's probably a very significant infrastructure that's beyond this. So I would ask uh, Corey or Andy who's not here or, or Bill or anyone else who's had interaction with it simply to do their best in making it easy for the rest of us to examine. Uh, when those of us who believe in UFOs are speaking to a skeptical world it is incumbent on us to provide evidence, and that's what we do. That's what I've been doing for over 20 years, and many of you here have been doing it. In other words, we understand that when you're speaking to someone who doesn't know about this subject of UFOs in general, that we are um, we're expected to give evidence as to why we believe it. What, what can outsiders or non-believers grab onto to allow them to say, oh yes, I see your point, you make a very good case. And we take that as a given. And so the same principle applies to any of, of people who are self-described whistleblowers who have evidence that they want to provide to the rest of us. It, it is incumbent on them to give us information that we uh, can analyze, that we can examine and critique because that's what it's all about. That's, what, that's actually what a free society really is about. It's about all of us being able to provide our information and having other people allowed to critique our information. Right? And that's what makes us strong. It's only by doing that that we actually can approach truth. So again, it's incumbent on whistleblowers, A, to identify who they are, what their background is, so that we can be satisfied with that. I've said this many times in the past, that there are people who are whistleblowers and we know exactly who they are. I think of William Binney as one such person. You can look him up. He's very, very easy to identify his background and his credentials. And so that counts for every single whistleblower. We have to know who they are, we have to be able to identify them, place them where they were, and if we can't do that, that's a problem. And on top of that, the evidence that they provide uh, ideally should be available for the rest of us independently to examine. I want to commend Michael, by the way, for doing some very good legwork leg on uh, Bill Tompkins and in uh, bringing out his, his background. Uh, that's still not the same as um, you know, going from sketches to a craft to indicating that these were actually built, that's a whole other thing. But, uh, but it's the, that kind of work we need to do. We need to do research to validate. And the whistleblowers, again, last time I'll say this, uh, really need to be able to make it easy for the rest of us to examine and judge their claims. Let me just say real quickly, if any of you want to, we're going to take just a minute here to finish wrapping this up. I know Michael has something to say, but uh, if any of you want to go ahead and exit for the next presentation on uh, Andrew Basaggio, feel free to. So we're just going to try to, to wrap it up neatly here. But I will say, too, from a uh, news person's background, those points are very, very valid. But I would add to keep it simple, because as in news, so some, some things and subjects are so highly technical that it just goes over everyone's head if they're not totally into it. And so from there was always a joke in the newsroom uh, that uh, you write on a third grade level. That's not to undermine the intelligence of the audience. It is to understand that people are multitaskers, a zillion things that are not necessarily backgrounded in, in your specific issue. So if you really want to get your point across, keep it simple, and all of the uh, factors that Richard uh, added would really help in getting your message across and, and, and getting it received by people who are not necessarily as well informed and researched as, uh, as the you, you, you get, uh, guys are. I, I do want to point out the, the kind of political aspect of this. Uh, you know, prior to my becoming involved in exopolitics, I actually was involved in um, international peace and conflict resolution, taught courses on human rights, and actually was a field investigator for human rights. I went to East Timor, Kosovo, Sri Lanka, interviewed many eyewitnesses. 
I could not ask them for evidence. If they had evidence, they would have been arrested. If I carried evidence out of that country, I would have been arrested. So the reality is, when you're dealing with a deeply political phenomenon, sometimes it's very dangerous to ask witnesses or eyewitnesses for evidence. So we have to be mindful of that. We have to kind of factor all this in, because there is a national security uh, dimension to this, and some witnesses, some witnesses or eyewitnesses, um, their lives are threatened if they actually possess evidence so and, and they w will kind of go to some effort to just uh, not associate themselves with any any evidence be just for safety reasons and I, I agree with you and uh, so there's always that balancing act that we 